you've got responsibility for everyone, all your staff, not just your, your direct staff that you work with around the football side of it, but the, the club staff and the board members, the owners, you've got the fan base, um, you have a responsibility to them, you have a responsibility to media, commitments, all those side of it. And um, as a player, it's definitely not as much of a workload as, it, as what it is as a manager. So the pressure is, yeah, definitely more on. Hello and welcome to the UCFB LMA Insight Series, where we speak to some of the most important and influential names in the world of football. My name's Holly and today I'm joined by Gary Monk, a Swansea City legend who played 270 matches for the club, proved crucial in the team's famous march from League Two to the Premier League and went on to become Swansea manager only a season after retiring from the professional game. Thanks very much for joining us today, Gary. Good, good to be here. Thanks for having me. So to start things off, um, can you describe what it was like climbing from League Two to the Premier League in only seven seasons with Swansea? Yeah, I think um, that was never planned. It wasn't like going there when I went when I joined the club that it was a, a plan of right. We got to go from League Two to the Premier League. Um, I think at that stage when I joined the club, it was kind of you could see it was a club moving forward. It was had a new the. Obviously, it was the Liberty Stadium now. That was a shell at the time. You could see they were building it. Um, obviously, that was council built, but knowing that we were going to, that was going to be our home from the following season. So, obviously, the club had been at the Vetchfield for such a long time, the previous stadium. It just felt like a club moving forward. And I think us that joined that summer with the, the guys that were already there, I think it was just a feeling amongst us that we had to finish that last season at the Vetch before moving to the Liberty Stadium um, on a high. And, um, yeah, promotion was the aim. So really, it was just to get out of League Two. Um, I think we felt that we had the squad and the, the ability to get out, to get out of League Two. I think we felt that we were better than that league. And then that was really the only mindset, really. Everything else beyond that after that um, wasn't really, obviously wasn't talked about at that time. But once we got that promotion, I think there was just a sense of, you know, we can go and get another one here. And um, unfortunately, that following season, we lost in the playoff final. But... Um, that progression over those seven seasons was, yeah, it was just, it was like a snowball effect, really. It was no clear one thing that went right. It was just a group of, of, of guys. And what we did in all those leagues, we managed to keep a really good core of the same players that went from League Two to, to the Premier League. And then what we did do is add really good quality around that core as we went up through the leagues, as each season went on. And then, yeah, it just progressed. I think we all got hungry and hungrier to, to taste a bit more success. Um, which is always a good thing. And then, um, yeah, but I think the main thing is we just had a really good atmosphere there. It was a really good environment. Um, we didn't have much when we started. We didn't really, we didn't have a training ground. We didn't have changing facilities. We were getting changed in cars and porter cabins and things like that. And then um, and as we progressed, we started even never had luxury, but I think that kept us hungry. You know, we saw other teams and other clubs that had a lot of luxury and we kind of, that was kind of motivation for us to try and beat them. And then, yeah, it, but what a fantastic journey. It was like, like I said, it wasn't planned. But I think as it started to snowball and come clearer or closer, um, yeah, I think we just had the right the right group of, of people, staff and, and club and fans. And, and um, yeah, we managed to be successful and get to the Premier League. So it was a fantastic journey. Brilliant, brilliant journey. Cool. So tell us about the moment you beat Reading in the playoff final, the one you did win. And you yeah. were going to play in the Premier League for the first time. Um, I think that's, for me, that, and I know speaking to a lot of the lads that played that day, um, it was my favourite moment in my playing career. It was just kind of the pinnacle of that journey. It was kind of all those years of going, through, even though you take each year as it comes and each day as it comes and you don't look too far ahead in terms of, you know, as a player in that sense. Um I think it was just the build up of all of those years of, of getting promoted and proving ourselves at higher levels. And then, yeah, that was the pinnacle. But of course, that day is a, a high pressure environment. Um, if you win, you can be the heroes forever. If you lose, <laughs> you can be the villains. But like, it was such a great day. Um, of course, because we won, that's why it felt so great. But I think it had just been such a long journey and so many of us had done it together. I think as good as Reading were and um, as good a game as it was, I think we just had that. I don't know, maybe it was meant to be, I think, because of the journey that we'd all been on together. So um, 
yeah, it was it was such a great day. It was just packed, family, friends, all the Swansea fans. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a blur. I've, I've watched the game back a few times and noticed things in the games I, I don't remember in the game because it's all a bit of a you don't you're so in the zone. Um, you don't really remember it too much. So, um, and then obviously celebrations afterwards, come back to Swansea and yeah, open top bus through the city and all that side of it. Yeah, just fantastic memories. But I, I think like a lot of us on that day, that was probably, even though we went on to play in the Premier League and had other great days and stuff like that and, and great days before that, um, I think that was for a lot of us, that was probably the, yeah, one of the biggest highlights in our careers just because of what it meant to everyone and the journey we've been on. I can imagine. So who is, in your opinion, the most difficult striker you've ever had to defend against? <laughs> um, yeah, I've been asked this a few times because I was a defender. Um, I, I kind of look at it as in like the strike force I'm up against. So it's not necessarily one individual. So I, I've come up against um, probably most difficult side of it in terms of strikers faces is probably more partnership. So I, I was um, at Southampton early in my career. I was um, lucky enough to play in the Premier League at 19. I only played a handful of games, really. I think it was 11 games in all as a young player. And I came against some of the top strikers in, in the Premier League at that point and probably in, in Europe and the world. So um, I played against Alan Shearer and, um, and Duncan Ferguson as a partnership. So that was a tough, tough day. Um, obviously, the, Alan Shearer is the highest ever goal scorer in the Premier League and, and Duncan Ferguson is someone not to be messed with. Um, Thierry Henry and Dennis Bergkamp at Arsenal. Um, again, a partnership that was different skill sets, fantastic, unbelievable players, um, obviously world-class players. And then, um, yeah, three partnerships I got. So Duncan Ferguson, Alan Shearer, um, Dennis Bergkamp and Thierry Henry. And then the last um, pairing was um, Michael Owen and Robbie Fowler for Liverpool. So another really tough day. But all of those partnerships, totally different, totally different skill sets in all those partnerships. So they were all really difficult challenges, but ones I loved. I loved it. And, Obviously, they're ones that stick in my mind in terms of difficulty. But, um, yeah, there were challenges that I enjoyed, definitely. Cool. Not the Liverpool one, though. We lost 7-1, so that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't quite the best experience. But it was just great coming up against world-class players and testing yourself at a very young age and, and yeah, getting that experience, really. Yeah. So what was it like playing under Roberto Martinez and Brendan Rodgers? Yeah, I speak can't speak highly enough of the pair of them. Obviously, Roberto was a was a teammate um, first at Swansea, and then he came back um, and joined Swansea as a manager. And I think obviously that helped in in that part where he had that little break away from us. But we all knew him as a teammate, and then he came back. But I think he had obviously he was captain at Swansea at the time, and um, and we all knew his character and what he was like. So that settling in period was was very good. That transition. For him to come back and now be our manager was was actually very good and, and because we had such a good you know relationship with him anyway especially the ones that have played with him um i think that enabled him to to come in and, and do what he did and and he was fantastic from day one changed our style um changed the environment that we were like how we worked and how we trained and, and obviously started that success of um obviously we won league one that season we were the champions of league one and um and yeah it, it started off that kind of that what people call the Swansea way, and um, it started that off. And then um, obviously, then Brendan came in, Roberto left, and, and went to Wigan in, in the Premier League, and um, we we're in the Championship. And um, as disappointed as we were with, you know, obviously, we wanted Roberto. We were doing really well and progressing, but obviously, Roberto had the opportunity to go to the Premier League, and then Brendan come in and just fantastic, unbelievable. Just not as a football manager and. Um, and from the football side of it, but as a person as well, just exactly what we needed um, from someone, you know, with a type of group that we had. And he just took us on to a whole nother level. And um, and you, that's why you see he's one of the top managers in the world right now. Um, and his career is just getting better and better because of, I think it's more down to the person he is than anything else. But fantastic. Both of them, great. Fantastic for the club. Fantastic for us as players to learn off and, and experience. and. Um, and yeah, that's obviously why they did there. Obviously, Roberto is now the Belgian manager, um, and and Brendan's doing fantastic in the Premier League with Leicester. So, um, yeah, can't speak highly enough of the pair of them. So, with Roberto Martinez, do you think it was quite like advantageous that you played with him and then he went on to manage you? Because that must be quite a unique experience. Yeah, well, I, I think with Roberto, 
the character that he was, even when we were playing, he was very much like a um, the elder statesman. He was very, um, you could see in him, he, he thought a lot about football. You could tell he was going to go into a, a management coaching type role. He, obviously, you don't know which one because you don't know what he pre prefer at that time. But you could tell he was going to become a manager or coach. And um, so it was no surprise to see him when... Um, it wasn't difficult. Well, we didn't find it difficult as players. Um, I know from the other side, as you know, I haven't done the same myself. It can be difficult because of you know, the different role that you're going to play. But for us as players, it wasn't difficult at all. We knew him very well. We knew that he was that kind of way of thinking and that he was going to be good. And, um, and we all wanted to support him as well, as well as do well for ourselves and, and for the club. We wanted to support Roberto because, like I said, we had such a great relationship with him. So it was no surprise. It, it was successful. You know, like I said, winning the league that season and and then going on and obviously Roberto left, but you know, to see him go on and that and and have the career he's had and so far, um, yeah, not a surprise at all. Cool. So how do you think the game changed and developed during your ten years as a professional player? Um yeah, it's changed a lot. I started at sixteen years old. Um I finished at thirty four. Um yeah, and it changed. Of course it does, like anything in life and, and in the world that we live in. You know, the methods and the information and the knowledge evolves at a great pace. And obviously new instruments come in. You know, when I first started, sports science wasn't even a thing. It was about just running as hard as you can every day and, and training as hard as you can. Um, but then obviously sports science started to come and nutrition, um, psychology, um, all that side of it has developed in, in all my time. I'm a, you know as a professional but I feel really pleased that I you know I had that experience before all of that as well um I think now where you know it's different for the modern day player where they have all of that straight even in the academies at earlier ages you know the analysis all of that side of it I, I'm quite pleased that I, I've been part of my career was before all of that so you had to self-think and self-learn and and um and understand how you analyze things yourself and then obviously when those more modern methods came in understanding them and how they can help you so having a bit both of those sort of experiences throughout my career i think that's helped me in terms of going into management and coaching my understanding of players and how they think and obviously trying to keep abreast of, of what's the best methods to use and or trying to find the best methods to use and not over just because something's new and fresh and it sounds great you know, it's, it's understanding that there are still things from along before all of this that work. And then there's things obviously now that are modern and are needed um, for players and then and understanding the modern player. So, yeah, experience wise, yeah, being it's obviously much more professional now as well. Um, I think it's probably the most professional, um, I think, across all sport, really, that, that it's ever been. Um, different types of players, different wants, um, different mentality now for, for modern players. And, and it's adjusting yourself, but with using your experience from before to try and help them. Cool. So did you feel more nerves and pressure as a Premier League player or manager? Manager, without doubt. Um, of course, there's pressure as a player. Of course, there is to perform and, um, and that's self-critical. And obviously, that outside you know, critique that comes through media and fans and obviously social media now and stuff. But as a manager, tenfold, for sure. Um, why Why as a manager? Because it's, it is, it's just, I think, what you notice when you become a manager and you, you probably don't ever, you, well, you don't ever feel this as a player. Obviously, if results aren't right or it's not a good performance, um, obviously as a player, you, of course you feel that. And of course you, t you know, you have criticism for yourself and like all those things that I said, but you have 11 or 25 guys that share it with you, that criticism. Um, as a manager, it's all on you. You know, everyone, I think fan bases and, and um, social media and media, the whole blame is on the manager. The whole focus is on the manager. It's your responsibility. If they play poorly, as much as they can criticize the team, it's your responsibility why they're playing poorly or it's your responsibility to put that right so it's that's why it's it's much more for a manager than it is for a player and obviously I've been both so I understand it so yeah the pressure again as a, a difference that I've noticed as well as a player when you've won a game often that jubilation of winning can last you know let's say across that weekend and even into the following week until the next game you know you can have that jubilant feeling whereas a manager 
I think more often than not, when you win, it's more just about relief. Okay, relief, that one's done. Relief, we've got the right result. Now I have to plan straight away for the next week, you know, what's coming next. So you don't really get time to enjoy where as a player you could, yeah, you could enjoy that weekend and enjoy it into the next week and up to the next game. Whereas a manager, you don't quite have that same feeling. So pressure-wise, yeah, it's, it's a total different ball game um, as a manager than it is to a player. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot more responsibility. Yeah. And it's not just players. You're, you've got a responsibility. You've got responsibility for everyone, all your staff, not just your, your direct staff that you work with around the football side of it, but the, the club staff and the board members, the owners. You've got the fan base. Um, you have responsibility to them. You have a responsibility to media commitments, all those side of it. And um, as a player, it's definitely not as much of a workload as, it, as what it is as a manager. So the pressure is, yeah, definitely more on. <laughs> So do you think it was a good or a bad thing that you had such a short space of time between being a player and manager at the same club? Um, I think a bit of both, probably. Um, I think my thinking, I was 34 at the time and I had a, definitely a couple more years of playing in, in me and that's what I thought I was going to do and then you know slowly transition into, into coaching. I think I, I kind of planned in my head to go into coaching first, maybe in academies or work my way up that way, get some experience in coaching, get some experience on, on that side of the fence, shall we say, and and then, you know, move into management, which was what I always wanted in, you know, or had planned in my head. And um, But it came differently. It came literally one day I'm a player, the next day you're a manager. And um, it's all about opportunity. It's all about assessing where you're at. And, um, and again, no matter how prepared you are or how prepared you feel you are, you never quite know until you're doing it. So... I think at that point, though, originally when I, when I took over as manager, um, it was for the interim part. I think we had 13 games left of the season. We were flirting with relegation. And at that point, I wasn't really thinking about management and being a manager. I think I was just, obviously, I've been at the club for 10 years at that point, And it was just about, obviously, being club captain. It was more about still being club captain. Yes, I have to pick a team and I have to put training, you know, plan training for the team. But it was more about still being that captain type of character and, and bringing everyone together rather than acting like a manager and you know I'm not you know I'm the one that's in charge and uh, you know I didn't act like that at all and it was more just conjoling the players into you know a togetherness where we knew we had the quality to try and get ourselves safe it was only that summer when when the club offered me the job permanently that I had to really seriously consider whether to take that opportunity or carry on playing and at the end of the day it was a, a Premier League you know the chance to be a Premier League manager knowing in my head that I'm coming towards the end of my career. I might never get this opportunity again. Um, probably just swayed me towards taking it. And of course, I was inexperienced. Of course, I didn't have a lot of experience of, of, of coaching and management, but I'm always being one of them. You know, you, you try and learn quick. You put yourself into that challenge. I've never been scared of that type of, of challenge. I don't ever fear things like that. It's more, rise. You know, can you rise to the challenge? I think... Probably sums up the journey that I've been on and that we've been on at Swansea. You have to rise to the challenge um, rather than fear it. And that's why we were successful. So it was the same sort of mentality going into management and um, learned a lot. Had to learn day in, day out, hour by hour. Um, and obviously my home life at the time as well, where I had twins on the way. Um, so the wife was two weeks away from giving birth to my twins and, and then being a Premier League manager having no experience, being a player the day before. So, yeah, it was a lot. But, um, yeah, real good learning experience for sure. Cool. So what was it like securing Swansea's first ever win over Manchester United at Old Trafford? Like anything, you know, to to beat Man United, you know, one of the most successful and historic clubs in, 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 this, in this country and in, in the world. So um, I remember it was, um, obviously it was Louis van Gaal's first, official um, Premier League game for Manchester United. So it, it was obviously in the build-up. We were, you know, like you expect, you know, Man United is this big organisation. We were a little old Swansea, not talked about too much, but we'd had a very good pre-season. Um, gone about our business in pre-season very well and the boys were fit and, and ready and we'd done a lot of, of preparation. And But all the focus was on Man United, as you expect. And obviously Louis van Gaal, and I'm, you know, what well-renowned manager so all the focus was on was on them and on him and um and yeah to turn up there on <laughs> on what seemed to be a big you know celebration for his arrival and everything and we kind of spoiled the day so um 
Yeah, I remember. I remember distinctively afterwards because um, obviously you have media commitments after the game. So generally, the the, the order is you, you go in and you do Sky and, and BBC interview, and then you go to the overseas broadcasters, um, then into the radios, and then you go into the press conference. And, um, and generally, it takes around forty five minutes an hour, maybe, to go through all of that. And generally, there's yeah, overseas there's probably two or three main broadcasters, and maybe five radios and then the, obviously the the press conferences maybe a few more but this one was packed i think there was something like 21 overseas broadcasters but it all come for, from louis van gaal's first game at man united and so this you know i'm this guy that they don't really know and walking walking into the all these interviews and then you know where they're thinking i don't really want you're not the one that we really want to be interviewing who's supposed to have won so it was quite funny like that that was a it was a good experience i had a bit of fun with that but um yeah, great experience for, for Swansea as well to beat Manchester United at any moment for a club like Swansea, where we've been, where we come from. Anytime you beat those type of teams, those super teams, should we say, and um, obviously it's a, it's a very good achievement. Yes, definitely. So as a recent manager of Sheffield Wednesday, how do you think having no fans in the stadium affected the game for players and staff? Yeah, it's been completely different. It's not an, an experience that any of us wanted and it's not, I wouldn't say it's the most enjoyable experience, um, I think, in sport in general, but from my experience in football and, and, you know, managing a team, speaking with players, staff, everyone, you know, that adrenaline buzz of turning up on a, on a game day and, and fans, you know, you drive in or, or you, you know, you come by coach and you're coming into that ground and there's the fans around and there's that buzz around the stadium, not just inside, but around it when you're arriving. Um that starts the adrenaline um, going in there, coming out in front of a crowd, you know, during the game when there's certain moments in the game that can swing that momentum, you know, and you, you've got the adrenaline going yourself, but those crowds give you that extra senses that get heightened. And obviously that's all missing. Um, that's completely missing. So that, that adrenaline buzz isn't quite there. And, and also I noticed as well, you know, in, in the games, like I, I just mentioned, you know, momentum swings and generally with a crowd, momentum swings can last longer or can go quicker and harder because of crowds in there. You know, a crowd's input into a certain moment in a game, whether that be you attacking or you're losing and you're starting to come back and they're willing you on. When they haven't got that, I noticed that, yeah, I noticed a lot that momentum shifts were harder to sustain. They were very short lived because, yeah, the players are trying, but it's very soulless and and ends quite quick and then with the crowd that's continuously pushing you, you know, because they can sense it and that's when momentum starts to roll. So, yeah, it, it's not the same. It, it's been a necessity, of course, um, but I think we're all, I think all of us in our lives, we're, we're pining for this lockdown and to come back to some sort of normality and, and sport, of course, you know, it's, you know, people live, you know, sports and entertainment, but it's nothing without, you know, fan bases and crowds there because that's, you know, part of the entertainment and part of the, the relationship that everyone has with sport so um yeah it's different it's necess it's been this a necessity but something that we're looking forward to change hopefully very soon hopefully yeah. <laughs> so if you could go back and change one thing about your career what would it be do you know what nothing and the reason for that is uh, um of course i made mistakes and there's things that you know, hypothetically you wish you could yeah, go, go back and change that loss into a win or, or that mistake that I did in that game into a win or that mistake as a manager I did like that and all that side of it. But I just think in life, you're, this is your path, you know. I think you have to have both things. You have to have failure and success, you know, and it, it, that's what makes you as, as your character. If, if you went back and you were changing things just for the good all the time, you wouldn't be the person you are and have the experience and you wouldn't learn. So um, uh, I, I wouldn't change anything for that reason, you know. In my mind, you would love to change certain bits. You know, I wish I had the right lottery ticket. I wish I put the right numbers on. We all, you know, we could all go and just say we go and do that. But I just think, no, I wouldn't change anything just because of that. I was, you don't learn. You need to fail and you need to have success. They go hand in hand to to get anywhere in life, and it builds your character. It builds who you are. So yeah, that's just the path that you're on, and you take whatever comes your way and and do your best with it and come through it. <laughs>